last Sunday night, we, we started on a Bible study, and uh, we started in Hebrews. Don't turn to Hebrews because I, I won't be in Hebrews very much. But I started the Bible study uh, last Sunday night, and I want to continue with it this morning and then finish it up tonight because it, it's a very important subject. It's a very important subject, but I do want to read the text verse that, that was the theme of the Bible study. And that was in the don't don't turn to this, write it down. Write it down, or if, you, if you're real fast, you can turn to it, but I'm not going to be preaching from this particular verse this morning. It was just a theme. It was the sixth chapter of Hebrews, it was the 18th and 19th verse. It says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. So what uh, the, the writer of Hebrews, who I believe was the Apostle Paul, is trying to say that Christians or people that are saved have an, a soul anchor. We, we have security. We have peace. We know that we have something that we can lay hold on. And it says all those that lay hold upon this hope that is set before us. Now notice this morning there's some flowers set here before us. And hope is set before a lost, dying world. And the world can lay hold upon that hope. And those that lay hold upon that hope have a, a soul anchor. They have an anchor for the soul. They have peace. They have tranquility. Because something has happened. And I want to show you what that is. And we're going to find this morning how so many people are looking for security. So many people are looking for something that will give them peace. People are looking for something that will give meaning to their life. And we have churches full of people this morning that want to go to heaven but have no assurance of their salvation whatsoever. And this morning, I hope when you leave here, if you are saved, you know you're saved and you are assured of the fact that you have a soul anchor. And I hope when you leave this morning, you will realize that salvation is of the Lord from the beginning to the end. And all he asks you to do is enter into this covenant by faith. You see, we are saved, what? By promise. What does that mean, saved by promise? That simply means God made man a promise. If man will believe that promise, lay hold upon that promise, then he has eternal life. It's just as simple as that. Now, Job asked the question, and keep in mind the problem with people today as through all dispensation is, they don't have a true picture of God. They, they, they don't have a true picture of God. Now, I hope the church don't get tired of hearing this. One time a person was going to hear Dr. Or Charles Spurgeon, great English preacher that lived back in the 1800s, and they came for a while and they said they quit. And they said, the reason I'm quitting is all of your sermons are just alike. And he said, uh, he said, yes, here's the way I do. He said, I'll read a text anywhere in the Bible, then I'll run right straight to the cross to, with it. And so I hope you don't get tired of hearing the same things over and over and over and over again, because you, but you see, salvation is in the gospel. It's in the gospel, all right? Now, there's a lot of good doctrines in the Bible, but salvation isn't in all of the doctors, uh, in all of the doctrines. Salvation is in Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that's the reason I like to stay around that thing. But Job asked the question. Now, first of all, keep in mind, Job had a good picture of God. Job knew who God was and what God was. We don't have that today. You can listen to radio or television or just hear people talk, and you realize people have no conception of what God really is or who God really is. They will make jokes or make statements like, well, I pray to the old man upstairs. Woo! You know? Or something like, uh, God sits on a throne with a foam rubber cushion. They don't understand God, but Job understood God. And he realized that he was no match for God. And you see what people don't realize. We're living in a day and in a time where man doesn't realize that he's just a creature. David said, bring the nations in under fear, O God, that they might know themselves to be but man. We're just creatures. We're not God. We're not deity. But God is God. And he's the only God. Now, the Israelites had the same problem. They didn't have a true conception of God. 
I mean, God led them out of Egypt and they saw that the, the great miracles that God had worked and had a little inkling of his power, but they'd never been in the presence of God. And so God told Moses, he said, Moses, I want you to gather the children of Israel around Mount Sinai, and in three days I'm going to come down on Mount Sinai, and he said, I'm going to speak with you, and when I speak with you, then the people will know that I'm speaking through you, and they will believe you forever. So Moses uh, commanded the people in three days, said, wash your clothes, get cleaned up, Come not at your wives in three days. We're all going to come at the bottom of this mount because God's coming down. Well, the people are, oh, boy, we're going to get to see God. And they were all standing down there on the third day, and all of a sudden the mountain began to quake. All of a sudden, the sound of a loud trumpet that just got louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And by the way, the purpose of the trumpet was to summon the angels from the four corners of the universe. God came down, and when his feet touched that mountain, he said the whole mountain was on a smoke. And the mountain trembled, and God told him, he said, listen, set bounds at the bottom of the mountain. He said, don't let any man start up that mountain. And he said, if an animal breaks through and starts up the mountain, kill it, kill it, because that animal can't come in the presence of a holy God. Listen, when the people saw that experience, Moses came down off the mountain. His face was so bright they had to put a veil over his face. Folks, that's God. And the people were so terrified, they said, Moses, from now on, you go talk to God. You just tell us what he says. We don't never want to go through something like that again. So Job asked the question, and Job realized that. People today don't realize that. People today do not have a conception, a conception of the great white throne judgment when they stand before the God in all of his glory and all of his brilliance. They don't understand what they're in for. Do you realize that that day will be so horrible that those people that are in hell today that are called up out of hell would rather stay in hell than stand before a holy God? they just rather just, just, just excuse me, please. I'll stay in the lake of fire, but don't make me stand before a holy God. And Job asked the question. Turn, if you will, now to the ninth chapter of Job. Job uh, said, uh, asked the question, Job asked the question, ninth chapter of uh, Job, first verse. Then Job answered and said, I know it is of a truth, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, in other words, if he contends with God, he cannot answer him, one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? Which, knoweth the, which removeth the mountains, and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger. When shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. And then I want to skip on down to verse 14. How much less shall I answer him, and choose out my words to reason with him? Whom, though I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make supplications to my judge. If I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened to my voice. For he breaketh me with a tempest and multi multiplieth my wounds without cause. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but fills me with bitterness. If I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. And if judgment, who shall set a time to plead? He says, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. And then Job, Job went on to say in verse 30, if I wash my hands in, in snow water and make myself ever so clean, I'll wind up in the ditch. In other words, as good as I possibly can be, I can't stand before a holy God. So he asked the question, how in the world how in the world can mortal man be just with God? Now, a lot of people at times, we, I don't think we understand justice. We don't know what it means when it says be just. How man, can man be just or justified? The word just means perfectly sinless. How can God look upon us as if we had never, ever committed a sin? That's what it means. Job says, good as I can be, there's still a flaw. There's still shadow. There's still, I'm still short of perfection. And he said, I'll be cast bound. But you see, Paul ran into this same problem, and we've had this same problem for 2,000 years plus. 
And the problem is, how can man be just with God? And there is a way, folks. But you see, the world, as they did in Job's day, and as they did in Christ's day, as they did in Paul's day, they're making the same mistake today. Man thinks he becomes just before God by what you do. You'll never make it. You'll never make it. Listen, right now, this very moment, if I said from this day forward, I'll not commit one more sin the rest of my life, listen, I'm still going to be condemned because of the past. Now, keep this in mind when you talk to people about going to heaven and say, well, are you going to heaven? And you know what? They, they, the first thing they want to do is tell you everything they don't do. Did you ever notice that? It's always the negative side of the ledger. Well, I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't run around. I don't get drunk. I don't do this. I don't do that. And they think that's going to let them in. But folks, listen. There's sins of omission and there's sins of commission. Yeah, well, what do you do? See? Do you live your life totally for God, sold out 100%? Well, no, nobody's perfect. Well, folks, you're not just in God's eyes. Listen, you see, look what Job said. He said, I'll condemn myself with my own mouth. And people do that. They'll say, nobody's perfect. Woo, boy, you're in trouble then. Because listen, if you're going to be just, if you're going to be accepted by God, by what you do, you better not say, God, nobody's perfect. You better be perfect. And folks, you've got a bad problem, and I'll tell you what it is. You're born of Adam. You're born with the sin nature. There's not a one of us here can honestly say, I've never sinned. Not a one of us. So I'll tell you what, you can't be right in God's eyes by what you do. There's got to be another way, and there is another way. But you see, the Jews didn't understand that. Turn to Romans, if you will. And Paul tells us how man can be just before God, how man can be accepted by God. There is a way whereby we can be accepted in the presence of God. And he tells you how. But people today are making the same mistakes they made in Paul's day, or all down through time, the same mistakes. Tenth chapter, verse 1. Now, the apostle Paul, when he was called, God called him to be an apostle, he really wanted to be an apostle to the Jews. He really loved his people, the Jews. But God chose him to be an apostle to the Gentiles, but he couldn't stay away from his people. He loved his people, the Jews. And he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer is for the Jews. My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is let me start again. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He said, that's my heart's desire. Now, he wanted them saved so much that in chapter 9, he says, I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. In other words, he said, I am so burdened for my people, the Jews, I'd be willing to go to hell in their place. Boy, now that's burdened, isn't it? That's burdened. He said, I, I, if God would save them, I'd be willing to perish. I'd be willing to trade places with them. Now notice what he says about them in the 10th chapter, 2nd verse. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Listen, they were the most religious people in the world. I mean, the Jews were very religious. I mean, they studied their Bible, continue. But he said, they're very zealous. They, I mean, they're right there. Boy, when the temple doors were open, they're right there. They're very careful to do everything just right. And he says, uh, they have a zeal of God, but he says, whoa, they're going about it all wrong. All wrong. What were they doing? He says, for they're going about to establish what? Their own righteousness. Do you know what they thought? Here's exactly what they thought. Boy, if I can just walk straight enough, if I can just be holy enough, if I'm careful to keep all the laws and pay my tithes and, and fast and do all these things, God will accept me. You know what Paul said? They're wrong. They're going about to establish their own righteousness. He said, that's wrong. You can never do that. Why? Because we're sinners. 
You can't come in the presence of a holy God on what you do. You can't do it. You'll never make it. My cousin uh, likes to deer hunt, and he goes up to Colorado, and there's a lady up there that's got several hundreds or thousands of acres. I don't know how much, but he takes his mules up there, and they camp out about two weeks. And he was asking her one time, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, if you was to die and you stood before God, and he said, why should I let you in? What would you say? And she said, well, I'm good to his animals. You know what she's banking her salvation on? I'm taking good something she's doing. I, I love his animals. I take care of his animals. And you know, a lot of people, they say, well, I don't go to church. They say, nature's my church. Have you ever heard people say that? I can just go out in the woods and I can just look at all God's created. And that's my, that's my, my church. Isn't that silly? They go back every Sunday and hear the same sermon over and over and over and over again. You see, let me tell you something about the woods, folks. The woods speak of creation, but they don't speak of redemption. See, if you go out in the woods and you look around and say, boy, there's got to be a creator God. That's true. You're right. You got the message. Get out of the woods and go to church and find the rest of the story. That's just an excuse. Come on. I'm going to church this morning. Oh, you taking a rifle with you? Yeah, I'm going to the woods to worship. They care about shooting God's creatures. Come on. You're not going out there to worship. You're not going out there to sit on the tree to, oh, God, what a great creator. They go to the rifle and they shoot, and if they miss, they start cussing. <laughs> Come on. You're not kidding anybody. And a lot of people think just believing there is a God is enough. You know. Well, some people don't even believe there's a God. At least I believe there's a God. And isn't it amazing? Well, they say, I'm as good as he is, or I'm better than he is. Ooh, yeah, but he, see, he's in a lot of trouble, too. That ain't going to do you no good until you can point to Jesus and say, I'm just as good as he is. Folks, you're in a lot of trouble because Jesus was the only man that ever lived was good enough. Amen. You see, he was good enough in that he was perfect, and that's what God requires. So how can a man be just before God? All right, now notice what he says here. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own goodness, fail to do something. Now, what is it they fail to do? They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. In other words, God has a way, folks. And it's not my way, and it's not your way. It's God's way. Now, look what Paul says. And it, boy, listen, this would bring peace. Peace would settle on everyone's heart here if we just believe this, hear this, and grasp it, and believe this. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. What's he saying? You want to be right with God? Do you want to be accepted with God? Then come to Jesus. Paul said that's the only way you'll ever be right with God. The only way you'll ever be right with God is come to Christ, let him forgive you, and then give you his righteousness because, folks, you don't have any. The Bible says your righteousness is as filthy rags in his sight. And so these people going around trying to do their own thing and be real good and never miss church and boy, everything, you know, they're trying to qualify to go to heaven so that'll never make it. All you can do that is acceptable by God is just come to Jesus. Just come to Jesus and let him give you righteousness. Jesus is your substitute. And Jesus lived a perfect, a perfect life in your place and that perfection will be charged your account because you'll never earn it. And God said that's the only way you'll ever be just in God's eyes. One time, Shannon went to school, and I'd been telling her this. I'd been saying, now, Shannon, here's what you do when you want to witness somebody. I just ask him. I said, what would you do if you died and you stood before God? And he said, why should I let you in? Of course, the answer is because Jesus died for my sins. That's the answer. So she went to school, and she was about sixth or seventh grade, and had a little friend there, and she said, let me ask you a question. If you died and stood before God, and he said, why should I let you in? said, what would you say? And that little girl said, well, I'm a good little girl. And Shannon said, wrong. Just turned around and walked off, and this scared that little girl. Dead. She said, Shannon, what's the answer? What's the answer? And she said, Daddy, she ain't even a good little girl. She really ain't even a good little girl. See, and, but we all think we're all right. See, we're justified in our own eyes, but folks, not in God's eyes. The only way you'll ever be just in God's eyes is to come to Jesus. 
Did you realize, stop and think about this. If there was any other way you could be justified, I'll guarantee he wouldn't have sent his son to die for you. And, and I, I think a lot of things Jesus did, he did for our benefit, not for his. A lot of times he would do something, he said, well, I know, Father, you always hear me, but I said that for their benefit. Now, I, I might be wrong, but I really believe this with all my heart. When Jesus, just before he's crucified, now, to keep in mind, he was God in the flesh. He knows all things. Eternity passed way back in the beginning of eternity. He knew someday he'd come die on the cross. He could see way back before the world was created, and he can see way ahead before, after the world goes out of creation. But just before he's crucified, he went in the garden, and he fell on his face. His sweat, as it were, gray, drops of blood, and said, Oh, Father, if there's any way, then let this cup pass from me. And then he'd get up, and he'd go, and he'd talk to his disciples, and he'd go back. Three times he fell on his face before God and said, Oh, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. You know what? I think he was doing that for our benefit. I, want, I think he wanted to go down on record that, folks, there's not any other way. There's not any other way. If there had been any other way that you could have been saved, God would have spared Jesus and said, Okay, folks, here's the way you do it. Just earn your way. But you can't do it. Jesus said, The only way, the only way for you people to be saved is if I go to that old rugged cross and pay for your sins. Now look, now, now, now let's go ahead. Just, now look what it says here in verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Whoa, what's he saying? Do you want to be justified in God's eyes by being good? Then folks, you better keep every one of the laws. And he says to break one of them is guilty of all of them. Because every law, every little minute law, every one of them carries the death penalty. The wages of sin is death. Now, if you want to know about the laws of God, turn to Leviticus, and there's chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter of God's laws. It'd probably take you the rest of your life just to memorize them. I mean, they were numerous because the law was in three parts. First, there was the Decalogue, which is the Ten Commandments. Then there was all the civil laws and how to run the government. You've got to keep them. And then there was what was called the law of the altar and all the various sacrifices and forms and ceremonies. And you know what Moses said? You want to get to heaven that way? You better keep every one of them. You can't be just by... And you know what it says? Paul says over here, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. No man's going to heaven by being good. <coughs> because, what the Bible says? For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. There's none good, no, not one. So, you say, well, Jerry, how are we saved then? Let me show you. God made it so simple. Verse 6, but the righteousness which is of faith, speaketh on this wise. In other words, here's what it says. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. You see, faith doesn't say, well, Ken, I might believe you if you can go to heaven and get Jesus and come down and I could sing for myself and talk to him. He said, that's not faith. See, if you have to see it, it isn't faith, right? And it says, don't go down, uh, uh, don't say, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Well, now, now Ken, I'll believe it if I can see him resurrected again. Let's see him do it again. Repeat performance. So that's not faith. Here's faith. Here's how you say, here's how you become just before God. But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. What's he mean there? He's speaking to the Jews. See, he would go to, he'd go to the temple and he'd tell the Jews about Jesus. And after he'd leave, they'd talk about that. And they'd say, well, what do you think about what he said? And, and they'd talk about, you mean this man died on the cross and if we just believe on him, then we'll be saved? They'd talk about it, but they didn't believe it, see? But he says, the word is nigh thee, even in your mouth. It's the very subject you're talking about. Here's how you become justified. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now what does he mean, confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus? I believe, I believe that Jesus was who God said he was. 
I believe that he was deity. I believe that he came from the portals of glory, took on human flesh, born in a manger, walked on this earth approximately 33 years, completely sinless, went to the cross, paid for my sins. God raised him the third day and ascended back to glory. I've confessed it with my mouth. Then it says, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's, you know that, I don't know. I'm, a, I, I'm simple. I, I'm just simple. I mean, I know. I'm gullible. I believed in Santa Claus till I was 17 years old. I'm gullible. My wife tells me stuff. I believe. But I don't have any trouble believing in the resurrection. I don't have any trouble with that. Why do people get hung up on the virgin birth and the resurrection? If God can speak the universe into existence, can't he make a little, little maiden conceive and have a son? If God can take a pile of dirt, spit the dirt, form it, make a man, breathe life into it, he stands up and becomes a living soul, can't he raise flesh out of the grave? Come on. You say, well, I don't believe that. That's the reason you're not saved. See, we're saved by faith. What does it mean? The faith that Jesus is who he said he was and who the Father said he was and that God raised him from the dead. And he says, those people that confess Jesus with the mouth and believe in the heart God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Not by your works, but by believing God. Then that's the only way you'll ever make it, by believing God. You see, God loves you. God wants you to spend eternity with him. But he knows you'll never make it on your own, folks. And so he had to send a substitute to do it for you. Isn't that right? And he said, the only way I can ever save this guy right here is send a substitute, and if you believe he's your substitute and accept him as your substitute, then you can be saved. You can be just in my eyes. Because when you stand before me, I'll see Jesus. He's standing in your place. Look what he says. For whosoever. It says the same God is rich to the Jews. He's rich to the Gentiles. You know what that means? God's no respecter of persons. <coughs> He wants to save you if you're young. He wants to save you if you're old. He wants to save you if you're thin or if you're fat. It doesn't make any difference. God is rich to anybody. God wants to save anybody. Christ died for sinners. That's the only qualification. You say you're a sinner, then you qualify. Now notice what it says. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord might be saved. Probably be. Hope. Hope you're saved. Didn't say that. Did <coughs> For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Not those that work and strive. Now, I really believe in works. I'm going to be honest with you. I believe in works. I believe when you're saved, you need to work. I believe you're free to work then. But you don't work for your salvation. You work because you're saved, not to be saved. You see? I prove that I'm alive in Jesus by my works. You see, a dead man just lays there. But when God raises you from the dead, then you want to serve God. You want to come to church. You want to do the things that's pleasing. But that don't help save you. All that does is prove that you are saved. That's the reason Jesus said you'll know them by their works. If they're saved, they'll do something. They'll do something. Do you know what? They, you've got a sweet little baby right here. And do you know what the first thing the mama listens for when that baby's born? Isn't that right? Same way with the doctor. If the doctor don't hear it, they want to know that baby is alive. And I believe that as soon as someone is saved, they're going to do something. Zacchaeus came down from the tree, and the moment he was saved, he said, Oh, Lord, if I've wronged any man, I'll restore it fourfold. See, that showed, boy, he was a new creature in Christ Jesus. There'd been a change or something going on already. But that didn't save him. Jesus saved him. And because Jesus saved him, then the Holy Spirit comes into his heart and produces fruit through him. So don't get the cart before the horse. Don't go out there and think if you do good enough, God's going to save you. Don't work that way. Let God save you, then you go out there and do good. See, that's the way it works. We're saved by grace. We're just saved by God's mercy. And you're saved by just coming to Jesus. You say, well, I don't know exactly what to do. Boy, I'm glad Jesus does. And he does. He's the great physician. Now, wouldn't it be something, Brother Marion, if you're sick and you go to the doctor and you say, Boy, I'm really sick. And the doctor says, Well, what do you think you ought to do? Ought to do. 
Well, I think maybe you ought to open me up right through here. Well, then what? Well, I think, well, go in this way. You don't tell the doctor what to do. The ho most horrible dream I ever had in my life. At one time, I dreamed I was a doctor. And I was sitting in my office, and the whole waiting room was getting filled up with people. You know, it's time to open. They're all out there, and the nurse come in there and said, Doctor, we got a whole waiting full room full of people. I thought, man, I don't know what to do. I don't even know how to give a shot. And I don't know what I'd, well, I can't. Is there a back door? I couldn't get out of there. And, and these people started coming. They said, here's so-and-so to see you. And here they come, and they sit down, you know. And, and I'd say, boy, it's too bad. Man, I hate to hear that. I just, boy, boy, I hope you get feeling better. Because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do for him. I'm not a doctor. I didn't know whether to give him an aspirin or a penicillin. I didn't know anything about penicillin or how to give a shot. I didn't know. I hope somebody didn't break their leg because I wouldn't have any idea what to do. That was a horrible, I mean, that was a nightmare, see. But a lot of people come to Jesus and tell him what they want him to do and how they want him to save them. You don't do that, folks. He's the great physician. He knows what to do. He just says, turn your case over to me. Just come by faith and say, Lord, I want to be saved. He does the rest. He does the rest. All he wants you to do is just admit you need a doctor. Lord, I'm sick. Lord, I need saving. Lord, I qualify I'm a sinner. Sick, fo sick folks go to the doctor. Sinners come to Jesus. Just simple as that. Are you saved? Listen, the great physician is here this morning. And I'll tell you something else. He never lost a case. Never lost a case. Never turned anybody away. Never charged a dime. He just stood and said, if any man thirsts, let him come. Let him come. He's the great physician. You say, yeah, but I'm a big sinner. Well, boy, you really qualified then. That's who he died for, is big sinner. See, the bigger the sinner, the more you're qualified. The only ones Jesus wouldn't say was those who didn't think they needed it, the Pharisees. He said, don't. He said, no, they're already righteous. Leave them alone. They think they're good the way it is. But when you realize you're lost, when you realize you need a Savior, then you come to Jesus. Now, the reason I say come to Jesus is because, folks, that's the only way God's going to do it. And you've got to do it His way, not your way. You come let Jesus save you, and then after He saves you, then go to work for, for God. That's the way it works. Let the Holy Spirit work through you and produce good prayers. Let's stand. Let's stand. Let's sing. Archie, what would you...